Hello, everybody. Well, uh, I thought I'd come one day early so that I would go over the jet lag yesterday and then be awake today, but actually it hit me quite hard this morning. So if I stare off at some point, uh, you'll know why, because I had a 24-hour flight. <clears throat> so anyway, imagine that you spend your days looking at the stars and seeing these fascinating shapes. Well, I started my career working with the infinity of space and handling the enormous amount of data that it can produce. But although I graduated as an astronomer, I switched to a career as a data scientist. But I guess I couldn't say goodbye to the visually focused astronomer inside of me because I found myself loving the visualization of the data even more than the analysis itself. So I switched gears again, and I'm now a down-to-earth data visualization designer working for Agen in Amsterdam, although I actually um, resigned last week because I'm going to go freelance. Uh, Whereas right now, still at night, I work on personal projects, uh, experiments, and write tutorials for my website, Visual Cinnamon. And I found that in data visualization, I tend to be a perfectionist. I love spending hours and hours on some small detail to make it exactly as I have in mind. And being born and raised in Holland, I always willfully hope that maybe my craving for perfectionism stems from the same genes as those of the Dutch master painters of old, who managed to put such a dedication to detail into their artworks. You know, it's a small country. So, even though painting and data visualization isn't exactly the same thing, I do always start my visuals on plain paper. And once I have a, a mental image of how something should look, the computer had damn well be able to create some semblance of that on the screen for me. However, usually what I have in mind isn't quite the default setting or what all of the examples are using. And it forces me to try and think outside of the box from time to time to try and recreate my concept. But you'd be surprised by the results if you try to experiment with the norm, use things in an unconventional manner, or get inspiration or elements from different fields of design to create a more effective or fun visualization. So almost ready to take off, go beyond the shapes. But first, let me explain how SVGs fit into the world of D3 which is a JavaScript library that has become the standard for online data visualization and is what I'm using for all of the examples to come. So once you start building with D3, you quickly figure out that its basic building blocks, its shapes, are SVGs. And by combining these circles and rectangles and lines and paths, you can create some awesome visualizations. And I'd like to take you along on my journey on how I started using SVGs beyond their mirror shapes. Well, my first step beyond the shapes came when I was trying to create a color legend. And I was looking for a way that goes smoothly through all of the colors that I was using. And that's how I got into uh, gradients. See, the point was that it wasn't really necessary to read off the exact value that each color represented. It was more about seeing trends and getting an overall sense of the numbers like in a heat map, for example. So this one shows the number of traffic accidents that occurred during one year and aggregated by day of the week on the vertical and hour of the day on the horizontal. And the darker color, the more accidents that occurred in that combination. So no surprise that the morning rush hour and especially the evening rush hour have the most accidents. But it's really about seeing these kinds of trends. It doesn't really matter if it was 1,470 or 1,520 accidents. And the legend below is what I mean with having something that goes smoothly through all of my colors. And it's nothing more than a simple SVG rectangle filled with a gradient. And because I'm going to show you a few more gradient examples, I'll first explain how you can create one based in the code of D3. And, and yes, I know this is a CSS conference, but uh, you'll see some JavaScript here, which is going to do strange things and apply CSS styles and do something to SVGs. And some of the things I'll show you could be done easier with just plain CSS, but I, I wanted to show you how that would work in D3's code. Because data visualization is based on data, so things are dynamic, so styles have to be dynamic. And that's why I also need JavaScript from time to time. But anyway, there actually exists a linear gradient element, and you'd nest that within a defs element. And defs is short for definitions, and it holds special things such as gradients and filters. It's very important that you give your gradient a unique ID so that you can reference it again later on once you set the fill style of your element. And now we have to define the direction along which a gradient should run across your shape. 
And you do that in a way that's very similar to creating an SVG line with X and Y. So X1, Y1 defines a starting point, and then X2, Y2 defines an endpoint, which is sort of like a directional arrow. And you can supply these values in both percentages and exact pixel locations, but usually percentages is way easier. And by playing around with these values, you can create a gradient along any angle that you might like. But what I'm showing here isn't quite true, because in reality, it's really the bounding box that defines where the start and end point lies. So a 0% zero, zero starting point really lies outside of the visible shape. And that means that once you see the gradient coming into the shape, it's actually already turned slightly more purple. And maybe you don't want that, and that's fine. You don't have to start at 0 or end at 100%. You can start wherever you want, and then the region outside of that arrow will be filled in with whatever color was present at the outskirts of your gradient. But we're just going to use a plain horizontal gradient. So after setting the direction, all that's left to do is supply it with some color information. And for this, the stop element exists. And you supply the stop element with a stop color and an offset, which is the location along that directional arrow where that color should be pure. So here I've appended a light blue color all the way at the start at 0%, and I need at least one more color for a gradient, so I'm going to append a dark blue color at 100%. And now the gradient is done. It's ready to be used. So I select my element, my rectangle, and I set its fill style by referencing that unique ID. So that might become tedious, appending these stops, if you have many colors in your gradient, but then we can use D3's data step so let's go back to that horizontal gradient right after setting its direction. And this time, I'm going to supply the gradient with a data set that contains information about the offset and colors that I want to use. And let D3 append a stop for each of these. After that, it takes two more lines to set the right offset and stop color by referencing the data that is now attached to the gradient. And finally, you get that result. So here is another example that is, in essence, a heat map and can thus be combined with a smooth legend. It's the visual output of a machine learning technique used to cluster data called self-organizing maps. And it's what started my love for hexagons. And I wish I could say I was using the color palette that's visible right now, but I started using this technique before I really got into data visualization. And, and I do come from a science background, so my go-to color palette was a rainbow, of course, which I now know is not a good choice for continuous data. It still looks nice, though. <laughs> well, staying in the rainbow mood just a bit longer, here is one of my favorite temperature visualizations, if you can see it. Um, so what you see here is a weather radial I recreated for New York for a year of data in 2015. And each of these bars is one day, and it goes from the minimum to the maximum temperature measured on that day, and it's color-coded according to the average temperature. And here it's really, again, about seeing trends. So when was it really hot, or when was it really cold? Well, being an astronomer, I, of course, wanted to make a visualization about exoplanets, which are planets that lie outside of our solar system. And my setup was to do a bit of data storytelling to explain how weird and amazing these planets really are. But to make these circles all rotating around one generic star a bit more than, well, flat circles, I turned them into tiny spheres by using a radial gradient. And I also made each of the gradients slightly different because I um, made them depend on the data of the planets. And creating database, pl uh, database gradients is also straightforward with D3 because we can use the data step like we did before in the legends case. However, now I immediately append my data set of planets to the depth element so that D3 will create multiple radial gradients, one for each planet. Still very important that you give each of your gradients some unique ID. And then afterwards, we can use the data that is now connected to each of the gradients to set something like the base color of a planet. And then I can make it lighter on the inside and darker on the outside, move that center location a bit, increase that directional arrow, and now we have something that sort of mimics a 3D sphere. And if you were to then look in the DevTools, you'd find that you have many radial gradients, one for each of your planets, and all of the colors for each gradient would be slightly different. Finally, again, we select all of our planets, and we connect them to the right gradient. 
Well, instead of showing you a visualization about exoplanets, about which many have been made actually already, I thought I'd show you what I think is one of the most important plots in astronomy, a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And here, the circles are no longer planets, they're actually stars. I've chosen some of our nearest stars. And on the vertical scale, we have luminosity going up, and on the horizontal scale, we have temperature. But note, actually, that the hotter blue stars are on the left, and the cooler red stars are on the right. And that's due to historical reasons. So our sun is somewhere over there. And these planets in the upper portion, like Betelgeuse and Antares, they are indeed bigger than our sun. But um, in reality, the scaling isn't quite right, because this is the true size difference. Yes, space is big. <laughs> But you know that this doesn't really make for a very readable plot. So that's why this, this downscaling is amplified. But also, stars are, of course, the things that shine. They aren't actually shined upon. So by tweaking that radio gradient a bit, I could try to make them look a bit more like the glowing orbs that they really are. So another reason why I really like this plot is that there's very little visual encoding done. I mean, stars, they're actually brown, and they are visible to us in these colors. So it's almost as if you're plotting the things themselves. And, and I personally don't know of a better subject to use for scatter plots than stars and maybe planets, but it, I might be biased. Well, besides using data to set the color of a gradient, you can use it to set any attribute, really, such as the direction along which a gradient should run. So after watching the second Avengers movie, I was interested to know how each of these Avengers were connected. How often had two of them appeared in the same movie together? And I thought that D3's chord layout, which is a chart type, would lend itself nicely for this data set. So here we have the result, where the thicker a chord, which are these inner lines, the more movies the two Avengers have appeared in together. However, by default, a chord is given one color. But that doesn't really work so well with this data set because the, the connections are symmetrical. Since if Thor appeared in the movie together with Hawkeye, well, then the reverse is true as well. So I wanted to do something else. I could make them all gray, but that felt a bit boring. So instead, I wanted to fill them with a gradient running from the color of one Avenger to the other. Well, to pull that off, let's focus on Black Widow. So for these five chords, that you can't see, actually. Well, that's fun. <laughs> Let's see how it goes fun. It's actually over there, Black Widow, five chords. You want to create five linear gradients, oh good, that run across these directional arrows uh, and that have a start color and end color as given by the small circles. So something that looks like this, but then inside the chords that you can't really see. Well, one of the many nice things about D3 is that it helps you prepare your data for whatever chart type that you want to use. So you supply your data, and D3's functions will transform that into widths and angles and, and paths, things that are needed to draw SVG shapes. And for this particular layout, D3 returns an array that contains all the information I need to draw these inner chords, and it's usually named chord.chords. So as in the planet's case, I immediately append my chords data set to the depths so that D3 will create one linear gradient for each of my chords. And one thing I wanted to point out is that in this case, it's actually easier to not use the bounding box of each chord to uh, define a direction, but instead use the uh, coordinate system that I've put in place with its origin right in the center of the circle. You can do that by setting gradient units to users based on use. But the reason is that in this rare case, it's actually easier to find the exact pixel locations of these two colored circles by using the variables available in the quartz data set together with some sines and cosines. So after setting these directions based on uh, the, the variables, we need to fill it with two uh, color stops. One at the start, that's color coded according to the Avenger uh, at the start of the court, and then one at 100% that's color coded according to the Avenger at the other end. And then with those changes, we get the following result where each of the chords is now a representation of both the Avengers that it links. But you don't actually have to use gradients as something that runs smoothly from one color to another. They can be very handy for abrupt color changes as well. So 
Many very fascinating analyses of baby names have been done in the past, such as the most trendy or poison or unisex name. But I was interested in something much more simple. I just wanted to know how had the top baby names risen and fallen from fame over the past years. And I was surprised to find out that the data available actually goes back to 1880. However, a typical screen isn't wide enough to do justice to 135 years of volatile change. So instead, I applied the focus and context technique, in which we have a small chart below that shows you all of your data, and then from that you can select a window that is then visible in more detail above. And you can move the window, make it bigger and smaller. But to make that connection between this bigger chart and the small window more intuitive, I wanted to color both of them the same, but only within the selected window, and then gray outside uh, for this smaller chart below. However, you can only stroke a line with one color. And I didn't want to have to cut these lines up, so before, within, and then after the chosen window, and then change that dynamically when somebody moves the window. So instead, I went for a gradient approach. So again, there's gray on the left side. Um, I appended a gray stop at 40, say 40%. And then right after that, I amended a, uh, appended a colored stop at exactly the same percentage, 40%. And then you get a really abrupt color change. Well, I do the same at uh, some higher percentage, but in reverse order. So first a color and then gray. And then we get another gr very abrupt color change. So if I now pick a rectangle that probably, yes, you can only see the center of, which has gray on the sides, it would seem as if you have three rectangles, but really it's only one with a gradient. And then by changing these two percentages, when somebody moves the window and some form of update function is called, uh, the window gradient really seems to move right along with the choices that the user makes. But it can also be very handy for showing categories. So here we have the, um, oh, the, mean, the trend of the mean body mass index over the past 40 years for a whole bunch of countries. And although not so abrupt in real life, according to health standards, you become overweight when your BMI is above 25 and obese when it's above 30. And usually what people do is that they sort of place rectangles behind these categories to make that more obvious. But I wanted to have something that was a little bit more subtle. So instead, I filled the lines with a gradient. And you can still see very well um, where that change occurs from, from OK to overweight. And even when you change your data from men to women, well, the lines, they just smoothly go over the gradient, so you don't have to make any color changes. Well, I was also very pleasantly surprised when I found out that gradients can actually be animated. And during a fun project at my previous employer, Deloitte, we had access to a data set that contained information about what education people had done and then what occupation they ended up doing. And we wanted to visualize these results from education to occupation. And I could have used a Sankey diagram, which is very good at showing flows. But the visual was going to be used in the media, and I was looking to create something a bit more eye-catching. And I have a lot for circular things, so instead, I went back to the court diagram, and with some tweaking and hacking and changing, turned it into something resembling more of a, a circular Sankey diagram. But I, I, uh, I then wrote a tutorial on how to recreate this and shared that online, and some people started calling it uh, the bad plot, which I thought was way more catchy <laughs> than circular Sankey diagram. <laughs> So, the bad plot. But anyway, here is the end result where you cannot see the chords. There are great chords in there. Uh, going from one end to another, um, and to visualize this uh, education to occupation flow, I actually filled that with a linear gradient, which I can see on my screen right now. Oh, here you can sort of see it. <laughs> to make that flow a bit more intuitively clear that people are going from left to right. Well, animating a gradient also gave me an excuse to put one of the most famous data visualizations there is in my presentation. And here we have Menard's map from 1896 about the enormous losses suffered by Napoleon's army in his march to and from Moscow in 1812. And what you see here is the movement of the troops across the land past villages and, and, and rivers towards Moscow in brown and black, back again in black. And the thickness of a line represents the number of troops that were still alive at that point, 
And then we have a line chart below that highlights the devastatingly low temperatures that the troops had to face on their march back. And what I did was, I remembered that first when I saw this chart, I wasn't quite sure how to read that. So I added a slight animated gradient to make it a bit more clear that brown is towards Moscow and black is back again. And when I see this chart, I'm always so sad to see that out of the 422,000 men, so almost half a million men that started on this campaign, only 10,000 made it back alive. While leaving SVG gradients behind, we're finally entering the domain of SVG filters. But to be honest, we're also sort of leaving the realm of effectiveness in the visual behind a bit, and going more into having or creating a bit of fun and magic in your visual. So creating a filter starts out very similar to a gradient. This time, we append a filter element to the depths, and it's still important to give it some unique ID. And afterwards comes the magic part, where a specific combination of filters can create an effect that you might have never expected. However, luckily, usually you can just copy and paste the same piece of code from visual to visual. You don't really have to make any changes, maybe some numbers here and there. And finally, we select our element and set its filter style by referencing that unique ID. So the first one is rather subtle, but it can have a nice, interesting effect in the right circumstances. Well, some people love radar charts and other people hate them. I'm personally not part of the latter group, so a few months ago, I made a redesign of a radar chart in D3. But although I was fine with it the way it looks now, uh, I remember coming across the code for some from drop shadow or text shadow, and I thought, well, maybe that might make this look a bit more engaging. And I'll show you the glow, it's very subtle. That was it. And it really depends on taste, whether you think this is better or not. But what happens is fairly simple. Say that you want to apply the, the filter to a circle. Then it creates a blurred version of that circle and merges the original one back on top of it to give the appearance of a glow. And you can uh, apply this to SVG rectangles and paths and circles, doesn't matter. And another occasion where I found that this had an interesting effect was when I was playing around with spirographs, which I used to love as a kid. And with a bit of glow, it just made it look a bit more neon and then lifted it off the page a bit. So another filter that has an interesting and subtle effect has to do with motion blur. So the faster and closer to us things move, the more blurred they appear. And with the right filter, we can recreate this effect on the screen as well. These circles, for example, the faster they move, the more blurred I make them to give the feeling of fast movement. And I first saw this effect when I saw images being blurred in an image gallery, uh, and I thought, well, data visualization often shows movement, so I wanted to see what I could do with that. Well, this filter is even more simple than the previous one, because you really only do a blur on an element in one direction, x or y. So now these circles are moving uh, without a blur, and with a bit of an exaggerated blur, you get this effect. So if I take away the blur and put it back in, and I don't know, it's, it's really subtle, but I feel like the second one just makes it look a bit more real. Well, I thought that a data visualization about the top running speeds of some animals and the fastest human would be interesting. Um, so these circles are going to move outward. The faster they move outward, the more blurred I make them. But you couldn't really consciously see that. It's more subconsciously. So let me pull them back in and show you just the blur that was occurring. So the cheetah is the fastest, so it gets the most blur. And then I calculate how much less the blur of the other animals and Usain should be in comparison to the cheetah. And just as a note, if you want, you can apply filters also to images that you've appended to your SVG. So if I move these outward, they get blurred as well. Well, time for my favorite filter, the GUI effect. And I first saw this one when I saw a really nice demo for a loading button. And during the Deloitte Ladies Open, which is a golf tournament, visitors could do a small golf clinic, and then we'd visualize the results. And to show how far the ball had gotten, I could just let the data points appear on the screen like this. But yeah, that felt a bit boring. So instead, I tried to mimic the golf swing by letting the circles fly out from zero. And you know, that, was, that felt better, but I wasn't feeling it yet. And, and then I remembered that GUI effect. And with that small change, the ball now seems to be ejected from the start, as if, it's, as if it is trying to acknowledge the effort made by the participant. And it, it didn't make the visual any more true or false, but it did, I did find it a lot more fun to watch. So 
I'm not going to even try and explain how this filter works because I only stand, understand about half of the steps. But besides this very nice GUI effect, it can also do really nice color blending as a bonus. Again, thinking about data visualizations, maybe you could have, if you want to plot circles on a map, you can let them fly out from some central point to their final location. Or instead, if you want to, yeah, if you want to group them back on a country level, you can, um, if they, once they sort of merge on a country, they sort of group um, into, into representing one country instead of all of these separate circles. And this reminded me of another fun example created by Mike Bostock, who is the creator of D3. Um, which is already fun. Oh, it seems, oh, it finally works. So, yeah, some sort of collision detection. But I think with a touch of goo, it becomes even more fun. <laughs> yeah. The most fun is if you can keep one away from... The... <laughs> anyway. So time for the final example. And this one has to do with those amazing color blending techniques where two colors overlapping each other can create an entirely different color. Um, I first tried to recreate this effect using SVG filters until I found out that it can be done with just two lines of CSS. But even though this isn't done with filters anymore, the effects are visible on SVG, so that's why I keep it as my final example. So these are my two favorite blend modes, multiply and screen. And for those not yet familiar, you can create that effect by setting the mixed blend mode to either multiply and screen. But it's also very important that you group your circles and isolate that group. Otherwise, you might end up seeing absolutely nothing on your screen, no error messages in the console, and you can't figure out what the heck you're doing wrong. But anyway, I tend to use this when I have cases of minor overlap. So here we have a very busy line chart showing the average daily temperature in 2015 for eight cities. But why should the greenish line of Amsterdam always lie on top just because it was plotted later? They're all equally important. And I could use opacities. But for one, I don't want the line of Amsterdam to be any less visible when it's not overlapping. And even with opacities, the Amsterdam line really still lies on top. So instead, I apply a multiply blend instead. And besides having sort of an interesting touch to it, it also, right now, at the point where things cross, you really can't see which line lies on top. There is a blend going on. So not, not one city is more important than the other. You can also do this for circles, but only if they're not completely overlapping. So here we have a completely random slope graph of animals where we have the same issues. For example, in the top left, we have a purple giraffe overplotting a red deer, but all the animals are equally important, so again, I apply a multiply blend. But maybe this effect really shines best when it's used in some sort of data art or generative art kind of approach. So for my final, final example, I'll show you something that I can look at indefinitely. And the color blending really makes for a more interesting result, because if I turn it off, you get this, and I'd say that definitely has less magic. Well, I hope that some of these examples might help you someday to create an even more effective or fun visualization. I hope even more that I've inspired you to always go beyond the norm, so that you have to make as few concessions to the computer as possible to try and recreate the image that you have in your mind. And finally, I hope that you'll go beyond the shapes. So you can find way more examples and all of the underlying code to everything that you just saw in the 10 tutorials that I wrote on them on my blog. And finally, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>